Um, thank you first for this invitation to come present. And uh, I'm familiar with many of your names and faces, and I'm even close friends with some of you out there. Uh, what I wanted to do was put some issues on the table that I have not seen commonly discussed, and that I think they ought to be front and center for these next several days. Unfortunately, I missed Professor Weinberg's talk, because I tried to get here. I, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning in New York City um, to get here, and the best I could do was halfway through. <laughs> I missed your talk completely, but I got uh, uh, halfway. You're forgiven. OK. <laughs> but I, I, I learned from informants that, in fact, we have some, uh, uh, some significant overlap in our discussion of uh, Islam from 1,000 years ago. So forgive me if I repeat some of what you might have already heard. But I'm going to bring it out anyway because there's a context, there's a broader context that I want to share with you. And I'm told I have full control here. Uh, let's see if this works. Oh, in case you're wondering, that's the Eagle Nebula. Uh, one of the few photos that you'll see that are this beautiful that are not by the Hubble telescope. Uh, this is a one meter telescope at Kitt Peak Observatory in, in, um, in Arizona. And the shape of the eagle is not discernible, it's almost, it's barely discernible in this frame because the eagle is, much, is about two or three times the size of this and the head of the eagle would be up here, so uh, up here and the wings off to the left and off to the right. Perhaps the most famous image of Hubble is a close-up of this zone right here which has been variously be called the pillars of creation, God's fingers and all sorts of other sort of religious references. People feel that way when they look at images of the cosmos, of course. I was always curious, though, that in the same universe you have things like the underbelly of a tarantula. And when magnified, no one thinks religious thoughts when they make those <laughs> observations. When it's, it's part of the same universe. So, uh, but I'll get back to that in a few moments. So here, uh, what I want to do is I want to highlight a few issues. And these are issues that came together for an essay I wrote that appeared in Natural History Magazine, the Darwin issue. It was the opening of our Darwin exhibit uh, that is now traveling. It's no longer there at the museum. But the Darwin issue collected together <laughs> stories, um, articles on the relevance of evolution, not only as a, an important concept in biology, but an important concept in all of science. And I thought long and hard about how could I possibly contribute to this? Because I, I, I don't know enough biology to be meaningful in that issue. And then I realized that there are elements of, in fact, the intelligent design movement that clearly there's a lot of teeth that members, people attending this workshop have put into that subject. And I asked myself, do I have anything con to contribute to that? And I realized that I did. And so I want to sort of fill a niche that I think is left unfilled. Uh, let's, so, so let's go through. Let me first start off with um, Ptolemy. I don't know if we know that he really looked like this, but uh, uh, Ptolemy, you know, was one of the greatest scientists ever and most influential scientists. And his most important work is, of course, Al-Majest, which is, which is Arabic for the greatest. And uh, in it, he sort of codifies the, he the geocentric universe. And this Earth-centered universe prevailed for centuries until Copernicus and Galileo turned that around. But what I want to call your attention to are notes that he penned in the margin of the manuscript of his work. Uh, let me remind you that back then, you would look up at the night sky, and the planets would move against the background star. They would wander, because that's what the word means in Greek, is wanderer. And there were seven of these objects, the sun and moon included. And they would just kind of move. They'd go to the left, and then they'd slow down and pause, and then they'd back up, and then they'd reverse again. And this was, kind of, this was a mystery, a complete mystery. And of course, the heavens were not Earth. And so the fact that you didn't really understand what was going up there was kind of OK and expected, because that was the work of the gods. And we being mortal down here on Earth, if you can't understand it, don't lose sleep over that fact. You perhaps never will. Now, Ptolemy had sort of the best going explanation anyone had put forth uh, with the epicycles and the like. But nonetheless, this is, the this is the boundary between what is known and unknown about how the machinery of the universe works, and he pens these words. 
which for me are one of the most beautiful and poetic references to the state of one's knowledge ever written. I know that I am mortal by nature and ephemeral, but when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. And so therein is this emotional, he, he, he's got this sort of religious feeling at the limits of his knowledge. And this is a trend that will continue for thousands of years to follow this, at least 2,000 years to follow this. And you don't have, and, and this whole notion of intelligent design, this is intelligent design. This, this, this quote that I just read to you is Ptolemy invoking intelligent design. No, he's not trying to get, it, get that into the classroom. He's not, you know, there's the politics of intelligent design in modern times. But what I think has been swept under the rug that we have to contend with as a community of people who are sort of truth seekers is the fact that some of the greatest minds that have preceded us have done just this, okay? That's Ptolemy, but we can go on. Who else do we have? Oh, Galileo, interesting case, Galileo, uh, was kind of an exception to this. Uh, we all know he's a, he was a deeply religious man, and a lot of the trouble he got into was because he was just kind of obnoxious, all right? He could have made nice with the Pope, and he did not. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> that's the Reader's Digest version of what happened over that period. But let me share with you some lines that he wrote uh, to Christina, who was the Grand Duchess of Tuscany. Some of these quotes you've heard before. Um, but I think they're, they're worth taking to heart. The Bible tells you how to go to heaven and not how the heavens go. That's one of the famous uh, quotes attributed to Galileo. Another one is, I don't feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. And so he was kind of the, f I see him as one of the first to say, all right, if religion has a, if there's any point and purpose to it, it's not to, be ser to serve as a science textbook, okay? So he was kind of the first to suggest this division, not to get rid of religion. Of course, like I said, he was a religious fellow himself. But it gets interesting when we get sort of philosophically interesting when we get to this gentleman. I can back up here. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Now, I don't know what you know of Isaac Newton, but everything I've read of his tells me that there's no greater genius to ever walk the surface of this earth. I'm just, just, I don't know if you've ever felt that about anybody. I didn't feel that about anybody. You just read what this man wrote, okay? Line by line by line, this, this guy was plugged in to the machinery of the universe. I think there's, he's unimpeachably brilliant. Unimpeachably brilliant. And uh, let me read again what we heard from uh, Mike Shermer earlier. In Isaac Newton's writings, by the way, in his Principia, here's the page one, uh, page zero of Principia, in it, he like d discovers the laws of motion, F equals MA, discovers the laws of gravity. It's, you know, it's all there. And he did this all before he turned 26. And in this, when he talks about motion, there's no reference to God. When he talks about his, his two-body force that he deduced, this universal law of gravitation. There is no mention of God. It's just not anywhere there, because he understood it. He was on top of it. He was there. Even though the understanding of the motions of the planets before he came along was given unto God, because nobody understood it, or nobody understood it well enough to really believe that they had a full predictive handle on it in the way the universal law of gravitation supplied. And so what you have is Isaac Newton abandoning reference to God until he realizes that if all you do is calculate the two-body problem, here we have like the moon and earth. Yes, he's got that calculated. Now you have the sun and the earth. You got that. But wait a minute. Now the earth and the moon go around the sun, and sometimes we're close to Mars and sometimes we're not. And when it comes near Mars, there's a, there's a tug that's stronger there than in any other part in the orbit. And then it comes over here, and then Jupiter tugs. And the, it's all these mini tugs. And so he's got to do this two-body problem for earth, the moon, earth, and the sun, earth, moon and Mars, Earth, moon, Mars, and Jupiter, and it becomes a rapidly complex problem. And he realizes that, in fact, applying this simple sort of approach to calculating 
the stability of the solar system, he finds he can't stabilize the solar system. He can't account for how we have stayed this way for as long as what was possibly necessary from the beginning of the universe. And so what does he say? He's, he's, he's at his limits. He's at his limits. And so you read Prince but God is nowhere until you get to the general Sholem. And then he says the six primary planets. Back then there were six planets, okay? Now there's eight, in case you haven't been keeping track. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even if you thought there were nine, there are now eight. Uh, the six primary planets are revolved about the sun in circles concentric with the sun and with motions directed towards the same parts and almost in the same plane. He's got the whole picture now, and he's trying to sort of account for that. But he can't just simply doing two-body calculations, certainly not without a computer or without a new kind of mathematics. He says, but it is not to be conceived. But is it not to be conceived that mere mechanical causes could give birth to so many regular motions. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This is Isaac Newton invoking intelligent design at the limits of his knowledge. And I want to put on the table the fact that you have school systems wanting to put intelligent design into the classroom, but you also have the most brilliant people who ever walked this earth doing the same thing. And so, the pro it's, so it's a deeper challenge than simply educating the public. It's deeper than, as you know by the books written by our scientific colleagues that do, that do take these, these, these deeply resonant and charitable positions towards their religious beliefs, maybe the real question here, uh, let me back up for a moment, you know, the, we've all seen the data, 40 there's 90 whatever percent of the West or the American public believes in a personal God that responds to their prayers. And then you ask, what is that percentage for scientists? Averaged over disciplines, it's about 40%. And then you say, how about the elite scientists, members of the National Academy of Sciences? An article on that, those data, recently in Nature, it said 85% of the National Academy reject a personal God. And then they compare it to 90% of the public. You know, that's not the story there. They missed the story. The, the sto what that article should have said is, how come this number isn't zero? That's the story. OK? So my esteemed colleague here, uh, 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 <laughs> Professor Krauss, Professor Krauss here, says all we have to do is make a scientifically literate public. Well, when you do, how can they do better than the scientists themselves in their percentages of who is religious and who isn't? That's kind of unrealistic, I think. So there's something else going on that nobody seems to be talking about. That as you become more scientific, yes, the religiosity drops off, but it asymptotes. It asymptotes not at zero. It asymptotes at some other level. So they should be the subject of everybody's investigation, not the public. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. So it's not 85% reject. Is that 15% of the most brilliant minds the, the nation has accepts it. And that's something that we can't just sweep under the rug. Otherwise, we're being disingenuous to, our, to the efforts here. 